Hello everyone, this is Michael Hart, and today we're talking about many people's favorite country, Canada. Uh, so Canada, why is it important from an objective point of view? Well, Canada is a country of about 37 million people, and it also has the second largest territory in the world, uh, which brings with itself a lot of natural resources to serve not so many people. And so not surprisingly, we find that Canada is a major exporter of many important natural resources. Uh, first and foremost, probably oil, but also others like timber. Canada is a very diverse country in almost any respect, ethnically, culturally, climatically. Um, forests cover about 34% of Canada, which is a lot, but it's not as much proportionately as the country that is slightly ahead of its in territory, that is significantly ahead of it actually in territory, Russia, and about 44% of Russia is forest. So uh, these countries with enormous territories, while we look at world maps and or regional maps, and uh, we sometimes stand in awe of the sheer territory uh, under control of a single country. We have to remember that the way things look on the ground are very different for human beings because uh, much of the territory uh, is covered by forests. Now, in terms of uh, agriculture, agriculture accounts for 16, I'm sorry, 6.8%. Uh, of the territory and uh, all other land is 59%. The vast majority of Canadians are positioned in a discontinuous band with approximately 300 kilometers or 180 miles of the southern border with the United States. I like how the CIA, and this is a quote from the CIA fact book, uh, you have a description of Canadians as being positioned uh, along the United States border as if they were poised to invade. But um, many Canadians live near the US border for various reasons, uh, not, not the least of which are economic and uh, weather reasons, uh, reasons of climate. So economically, because they're connected to the United States by economic ties uh, and uh, because it's warmer in the southern part of Canada. Okay, water. Canada is blessed by uh, a lot of fresh water. Uh, almost 9% of its territory is water. Canada has over 2 million and possibly over 3 million lakes. More lakes than all other countries combined. So the margin of error here is 1 million. Obviously, uh, eventually we'll, there will probably be more exploration and satellite reconnaissance might be able to tell us whether there really is a lake under thick sheets of ice in some places or uh, lakes were just suspected and never actually never there. So um, somewhere between three million. Of the five great lakes in North America, only Lake Michigan lies wholly within the United States. All other great lakes are split between the United States and Canada. Uh, lake Superior is, of course, the largest of the great lakes in both the surface and volume. Um, and uh, it could contain all other great lakes plus three more lakes like the size of Lake Erie. So Lake Superior is by far the largest one. Canada is also blessed with a lot of rivers. Nobody knows the exact number because it depends on the definition of river. Uh, there may be hundreds of thousands to millions. Here uh, you will find pictured the Ottawa River, which separates uh, Ontario from Quebec. Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls is the collective name for three different waterfalls that straddle the international border between the Canadian province of Ontario in the American state of New York. They form the southern end of the Niagara Gorge. Uh, so the largest of the three waterfalls is the Horseshoe Falls, which lies on the border of Canada and the United States. Uh, then there's American Falls in the middle, which lies on the US side, and Bridal Veil Falls, the smallest, uh, lies on the US side. 
Horseshoe Falls is the most powerful waterfall in North America as measured by flow. Demographics of Canada is another truly fascinating topic. Canada is an old country. Uh, it's significantly older than the United States as of this recording, that is to say, as of the end of 2020. The median age in Canada is 42.2 years. Guess what it is in the United States? 38.2 years. So Canadians on average are four years older than Americans and uh, the United States of America is a pretty old country. So what we see in case of Canada is despite uh, all of the immigration, uh, the, the average age re uh, remains pretty high. Um, it's not one of the oldest countries in the world. Uh, if you look at a country like Japan, the median age in Japan is 48. And uh, when you get there, that becomes alarmingly old for your median age. And Japan, as you probably know, resisted uh, mass immigration, at least so far. Um, major metropolitan areas, uh, the figures given here are all for the entire metropolitan area, not just for the city. So Toronto, GTA, Greater Toronto Area, is 6.1 million followed by Montreal, 4.1 million, followed by Vancouver, 2.5 million, Calgary, 1.5 million, Edmonton, 1.4 million, and Ottawa, 1.4 million. Mother's mean age at first birth is 28, which is older than average by the world standards. People live a long time in Canada and uh, Total population life expectancy is 82 years. And if you have a breakdown, male versus female, uh, what you find is the same pattern that you find in almost every country in the world uh, where women live appreciably longer than men. For women, it's 84.7 years life expectancy with 79.3 years for men. Fertility rate is very low, 1.6 children born per woman. That's even lower than in the United States where it's uh, 1.8 children born per woman. I remind you that it takes 2.1 children on average just to hold the population steady. That fertility rate uh, is uh, the replacement rate. It holds the population steady. So with 1.6 children, what you would have had uh, without immigration uh, would be population decline. And it's only thanks to immigration that Canada's population not only uh, hadn't declined, in fact, it went, it went up significantly in recent decades. Obesity rate is alarmingly low, high, uh, almost 30%, uh, despite the fact that Canadians are known for being outdoors, people that they get out more than say people in the United States. Uh, so as countries of the world grow richer and as more and more jobs involve sedentary jobs uh, and, and food becomes cheaper and cheaper relative to income, uh, it becomes very easy to overeat and to neglect watching one's weight. So uh, obesity is a major, major issue in Canada. Unemployment rate was very low in recent years, of course. This was all before COVID-19 uh, hit uh, North America in uh, 2020. So with COVID-19, we have a significant spike in, uh, in the unemployment rate, but that is almost certainly temporary. Government, those of you who have not taken any of my political science courses might not know of these terms. Constitutional monarchy, which Canada is one, uh, involves a uh, political arrangement in which there is a monarch, like the queen or the king, and the monarch reigns but does not rule. Uh, that's the situation in Canada. In Canada, the queen of England is also the queen of Canada, and while she is the head of state, she is not the head of government. Being the head of state means that you are a figurehead. 
you are the living, breathing representation of that country, but you're not that country's ruler. Canada has a parliamentary system. Unlike the United States, it does not employ separation of powers. The parliament is supreme. Uh, Canada is federal, like uh, a number of other countries, such as India or the United States. Uh, to say that a country is federal is to say that there exists an intermediate level of government between the country's national government and its local governments. So uh, in Canada, that level of government is known as the provincial level because Canada has provinces. In the United States or in India, uh, this level of government would be known as the state level because United States and India call their intermediate level of government uh, state, state level of government. So the capital uh, of Canada is, of course, Ottawa. Canada has six time zones. It's got 10 provinces and three territories. And here you can see all their names listed. Canada became independent on July 1st, 1867. Canada's independence came on the heels of America's acquisition of Alaska. Those of you who studied uh, American history or Canadian history might know that the United States purchased Alaska in the spring of 1867 from Russia. And uh, the grand design behind the purchase uh, which was engineered by um, American uh, Secretary of State William Henry Seward, was to make that acquisition a first step toward a greater North American empire. Uh, Seward wanted the United States to stretch from the Arctic to the Antarctic, to basically take over the whole Western Hemisphere, and then from there to commercially expand into Asia. So that was meant to be the first step and uh, Canadian newspapers, and Canada at the time was still under the British rule, uh, Canadian newspapers became uh, concerned that uh, British Columbia would be next. And the United States, by chicanery and financial manipulation and pressures, would try to get British Columbia, and after that, all of Canada, and so on. And um, uh, this plan, while it may seem a little bit... Uh, Quixotic is strange today, uh, Seward was serious about it and he thought that the capital of this greater United States uh, would not be a single city, but there would be two cities, Minneapolis and Mexico City. So an outlandish dream as it might have been, the British were concerned and the British did not want the United States to increase at that time to increase in power even more. So the British granted Canada its independence the same year that the United States acquired Alaska in hopes that this newly formed country of Canada would be a better bulwark against the United States expansion because now there would be this, not a part of an empire, but an independent country and Americans would be more reluctant to take over an independent country and be seen as aggressors because after all they themselves seceded from the British Empire to be independent. Uh, anyway, Canada is one of the few countries which has um, citizenship by birth. The United States is another. Most countries don't do that, at least not anymore. Um, in most countries of the world, what you find is citizenship defined by blood. You're a citizen if your parents were citizens, or in some cases, if one of your parents is a citizen. Uh, but in Canada and the United States, if you're born on the soil of the country, you're automatically a citizen of that country, irrespective of the citizenship status of your parent or parents. So citizenship also does exist by descent if your parents are citizens you too are a citizen if you're born, even if you're born abroad. And Canada recognizes dual citizenship in most situations. Uh, a residency requirement for naturalization. This pertains to people who immigrate to Canada uh, legally and then try to become citizens as the next step. So the minimum of three years uh, of three of the last five years residency in Canada. So you need to 
uh, spend uh, to, to immigrate legally, first of all, and then spend at least three of the last five years as a resident of Canada. So the total wait time is five years before you apply for citizenship. And of those five years, three must have been spent inside Canada. Now, as far as the electoral system, you have to be at least 18 years old to vote, which parallels what you find in most democratic countries today. The chief of state, I already explained, is the queen. The queen of England is also the queen of Canada. Uh, the prime minister is the head of government. And as of this recording, Justin Trudeau is still the prime minister of Canada. Uh, the legislature, parliament, is bicameral. That is to say, it has two chambers. Bi means two, cameral refers to chambers. The Senate has 105 seats, the House of Commons, 338 seats. Uh, the next House election uh, will be held on October 16th, 2023. The Senate is not elected. All 105 senators are appointed. They're, they are assigned uh, based on the regional basis. And uh, Governor General, uh, on advice of Prime Minister, appoints senators. The Senate can, at least in theory, reject bills that are passed by the House of Commons. But it doesn't do so very often, uh, like about two bills per year. And even then, sometimes when those two bills are rejected, they, the House makes some changes and the, those laws are passed on a second try. Uh, so the the purpose of the Senate is to be a uh, sober second thought, to be a kind of chamber uh, for additional reflection, to express, to air various reservations. But the Senate uh, doesn't have really in practice, does not have the same power as the House. The, the House of Commons really rules. And more specifically, when the majority in the House of Commons picks the prime minister and the prime minister picks his cabinet or her cabinet because Canada did have one female prime minister in the past, Kim Campbell. So it's the prime minister and his or her cabinet which actually make policy and they are responsible to the parliamentary majority in the House of Commons. The economy in Canada is uh, very typical the economy of prosperous countries, economically advanced countries of the world today. And, um, you know, much of Canada's economy here, you can see its size, GDP growth, everything is very typical. Uh, before COVID-19 hit, Canada experienced its lowest unemployment rate in 40 years. Uh, GDP per capita is very high. It's close to that of the United States, not quite, uh, but relatively close. Canada, unsurprisingly, is a service-based economy, like every other modern economy. In Canada, services take o over 70% of the GDP, industry 28%, and agriculture 1.7%. So we see even in Canada, a country that is so richly endowed by land and natural resources, agriculture comes in as less than 2% of the GDP. So in the modern world, in modern prosperous economies, wealth is generated not through agriculture, not through intensive land use, uh, but primarily through services and secondarily through industry. Agricultural products include wheat, barley, oil, seed, tobacco, fruits, vegetables, dairy, fish, forest products. The industries that are important to Canada are transportation equipment, chemicals, processed and unprocessed minerals, food products, wood and paper products, fish products, petroleum, natural gas, services of banking and finance, tourism and hospitality, music and movies, legal accounting, education, healthcare, and telecommunications. Labor force. Now, labor force in Canada is almost 20 million strong. 
services employ 76%, manufacturing 13%, construction 6%, agriculture 2%, and everything else 2%. Exports account for more than 433 billion. Uh, commodities that are frequently exported are car parts, industrial machinery, aircraft, telecom equipment, chemicals, plastics, fertilizers, wood pulp, timber, crude petroleum, natural gas, electricity, and aluminum. Major export partners are the United States and China. The United States, by the way, dwarfs every other trade partner that Canada has, suggesting the importance of geographical proximity and also, of course, the size of the U.S. market. So Canada exports 76%, more than 76% of its exports to just one country, the United States. Canada imports slightly more than it exports, just under $500 billion worth. Uh, the important commodities are machinery and equipment, motor vehicle parts, crude oil, chemicals, electricity, durable consumer goods. Major import partners are the United States, China, and Mexico. And here we see a similar pattern uh, which points to the importance of geographic proximity and the sheer size of the United States market. Uh, Canada imports over half of all its imports from one country, the United States. Energy, electricity from renewables is awesome in Canada. That's 65% way more, uh, five times more if, uh, than in the United States, almost exactly five times more. Hydroelectric uh, accounts for 53.7 and all other renewables like sun, wind, geothermal, 11.4%. This is a, a pattern in most countries that use renewable sources of energy. In the United States too, you will see that among renewables, Hydroelectric dominates, and all others follow. Uh, electricity from fossil fuels, 26.3%. Electricity from nuclear, 9%. Crude oil production is very high. Crude oil exports are very high. And the United States, as an example, relies very heavily on Canadian uh, crude oil exports. Uh, crude oil proven reserves, uh, enormous. Canada is the third in the world. Natural gas production uh, is also enormous uh, in Canada. Uh, internet, over 32 million people out of 37 million uh, use the internet. Percent of population that uh, uses the internet is about 90%. Uh, major internet service providers are Bell, Rogers, Telus, and Shaw. Average monthly cost is about $66, but that was five years ago. Don't know if it's Canadian or American, but in North America, internet is expensive, even at moderate speeds. Even if you're under one uh, gigabyte uh, per second, it's still the cost is significant. Transportation is very well developed. A number of registered air, air carriers is 51. Number of registered aircraft operated by air carriers is 879. Annual passenger traffic on registered air carriers, 80 million plus. Again, this was before COVID hit in 2020. And here you see various statistics. I will not rattle them all off, but you, you can see that the infrastructure of Canada is undeveloped. The military, here you, you will find an obvious difference between the United States and Canada but a similarity between the United States, I'm sorry, between Canada and uh, other economically advanced countries, not including the United States. So Canada spends just 1% of its uh, gross domestic product on the military. This is very much in line with what you find in uh, Western European countries like Germany, but not France, for example. Uh, France and the United States use between four and 5% of their GDP for the military. So one of the reasons why Canada is able to maintain a very high level prosperity and pay for things like free higher education, which is not always free and not to everyone at all times, but which can be obtained for free or to nominal cost um, and free health care. Uh, one of the reasons why this is happening is because Canada spends such a small percentage 
of its wealth on the military. The United States proportionately spends five times as much, and in absolute numbers, I mean, e e even more, more than that. So, uh, because Canada's real military is the United States military, that is its real defense. So it doesn't need to uh, spend uh, more than it al already spends. Cities of Canada, Toronto is the first city, really, uh, because nothing rivals it in, in terms of sheer size of the population and the sheer density of various uh, cultural uh, landmarks. Uh, Greater Toronto area is now over 6 million people. Uh, Toronto's population is highly diverse and it is now a majority minority city, meaning that the majority of people residing in the Greater Toronto area uh, are now minorities. Toronto is in the middle of the great North American hub of sports and culture. And you can spend a lifetime visiting various cultural spots in Toronto and within two hour airplane ride uh, from the city because there's so many great historical cities and cultural landmarks located in the, this uh, region of the Northeast and the Midwest. Toronto Hockey Hall of Fame, Toronto Maple Leafs have won a lot of Stanley Cup championships, primarily now in the distant past. Uh, in recent decades, the franchise has been uh, much less successful, to put it mildly. But Toronto is a great hockey town with a very passionate uh, hockey following. And here you can see various hockey masks, other paraphernalia, women's hockey too. Canada, I believe, have won the most uh, world championships and Olympics among women. The Art Gallery of Ontario is one of the most awesome cultural attractions in Toronto. There's an endless display of sculptures and paintings. I particularly like this one by, uh, by Otto Dix, uh, who painted the picture of Dr. Heinrich Stadelman. Nobody knows who Heinrich Stettelmann was, probably not even in, in Germany, uh, but everyone uh, in Germany knows who Otto Dix is. Um, Otto Dix was a very famous painter of the uh, Weimar Republic period and also during the, the Nazi period. Uh, but here, Professor Stettelmann is pictured uh, as somebody who is under the influence of his own hypnosis and also somebody who is worn down and uh, uh, not in the best physical shape, I have to say. I, I, I call it professor at the end of the semester. Sometimes I look like this at the end of the semester. Uh, but maybe I look worse. I don't know. Uh, yeah, Otto Dix was a, a clinical psychologist. Some German sources describe him as a psychiatrist. But when you do go down the rabbit hole of various uh, psychological and psychiatric uh, issues that other people have, um, some of those, I would venture to say, rub off on you and, and, and you too become kind of uh, influenced, influenced by uh, all sort of human idiosyncrasies uh, and uh, personality distortions that you, you come across in dysfunctions. And that leaves a mark. And I guess that's what Otto Dix was trying to communicate here. So that's all Art Gallery of Ontario in Canada. The Gardner Museum uh, is a ceramics museum, which is awesome. Uh, one of the best places for ceramic art that you can find in North America. And then Royal Ontario Museum, which is gigantic. It has everything from uh, you know, Victorian style furniture to traditional Native American uh, costumes to uh, dinosaur books. The next city is Vancouver. Vancouver is the gem of the West Coast in Canada, and it's the third largest city after Toronto and Montreal. The population is 2.5 million people, and uh, it consistently ranks, Vancouver does consistently rank among the top five cities for livability uh, because uh, of its low crime rate, very good ecology, 
especially for a big city. Uh, and uh, various nat natural and cultural attractions. The demographics of Vancouver show the population is growing ever more diverse. As of last census, Caucasians were 52.5% of the population, followed by, followed by East and Southeast Asians with almost 30% of the population, South Asians, 11% Aboriginals, 2% Middle Easterners, just over 2%, Latinos, 1.3%, and people of African origins, 1%. So uh, yeah, Vancouver has uh, received a lot of immigrants from East uh, Asia, East, Southeast, and Northeast Asia. And uh, a, a lot of influx of money, particularly from Hong Kong and China since the 1990s. Canada, like the United States, um, over the last 30 years, uh, has seen a, a transfer, an investment, you might say, of trillions of dollars from China into Canada and the United States. Uh, while legally there are severe limitations on how much money you can take out of mainland China, I believe it's $50,000 as of this recording, uh, you can in fact circumvent these restrictions and for practical purposes take you know, pretty much as much money as you want out of China. So Vancouver has been a recipient of much of the uh, East Asian wealth. Main museums, Museum of Vancouver, Vancouver Maritime Museum, Vancouver Police Museum and Archives, BC Sport Hall of Fame. There are many picturesque sites uh, in Vancouver. It's one of the best cities for jogging, CrossFit and exercise of all kinds. Robson Street is famous for its uh, art gallery, Vancouver Art Gallery and for its picturesque scenery. There are many uh, good uh, places to go skiing, to go snowboarding, and spectacular vistas open up as you go up the mountains around the Great Vancouver area. Downtown Vancouver is one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful downtowns in North America. I mean, if you like Chicago, which is a different style, um, then maybe you would go for Chicago. But to me, uh, really, Chicago is the only one that can compete uh, in terms of the, st the striking beauty of downtown. And in Vancouver, downtown is uh, relatively clean, uh, safe. It's just, just amazing. Vancouver, British Columbia has received a lot of uh, cinematography investment as the uh, cost of making movies escalated in Los Angeles. Um, many productions have moved to Vancouver, not just for movies, but also for television shows, most famous of which in the 90s when I was young was probably uh, Stargate SG-1 and the continuation of the franchise Stargate Atlantis, which was this um, Canadian-American production uh, employing Canadian actors like Michael Shanks and American actors like Richard Dean Anderson and Corinne Nemec and Christopher Judge and Don C. Davis. Terrell Rothery uh, is um, from Canada originally. Next slide. There are many comedians, uh, famous Canadian comedians who made it big in the United States. Can Canada is a much smaller market. So if you're a comedian, but you're ambitious enough to, to be a multimillionaire, the only way to get there really is to hit it big in the United States. And many did, many did. Jim Carrey, Russell Peters, Mike Myers, Seth Rogen, Norm MacDonald, John Candy, Martin Short, Howie Mandel, Dan Akert, and Tom Green are all native Canadians. Same with musicians, because America's market is much larger. If you want to be rich, you have to make it big in the United States. Uh, Shania Twain, Alanis Morissette, Alan, uh, I'm sorry, Anne Murray, uh, Carly, call me maybe, Ray Jepsen, Avril Levin. You, you don't hear much about Avril Levin anymore. Uh, Neil Young, Brian Adams, Leonard Cohen, 
uh, Michael Bublé, and of course, for all the believers, no, just no, Justin Bieber. Uh, yeah, so maybe he's not a good example of Canada's good cultural export, but you know, he is. Sports in Canada, well, it, it really is hockey. So I know maybe curling fans will be mad at me, but hockey dominates Canada. It was invented there uh, in the 19th century. So, um, and for, uh, for about a century, Canada dominated uh, the game of hockey until the Soviet Union came along and uh, matched uh, Canada's uh, skill in the game. So, yeah, that, that basically is the situation. And today, Canadian players play all over the world, including in the best uh, league, hockey league in the world, which is the NHL, the National Hockey League. Uh, so it's not unusual for teams that are based in the United States to have five, six, eight, ten players who are native to Canada. And in, in case of the United States, it's not unusual to have teams where the majority of players are from some someplace else. Canada, Russia, Sweden, Czech Republic, uh, Finland, etc. Um, the Canadian teams, Canadian-based teams in the NHL are... Montreal Canadiens, Toronto Maple Leafs, Ottawa Senators, Winnipeg Jets, Edmonton Oilers, Calgary Flames, and Vancouver Canucks. I hope I didn't miss any. I don't want any Canadian fans to go after me and say, oh, no, this guy missed some, uh, my favorite team. Uh, no, but Canadian teams haven't won uh, the Stanley Cup in a very long time. If memory serves me, the last team to do it uh, was Montreal Canadiens, who defeated the LA Kings uh, in 1993, four games to one in the Stanley Cup Finals. So since then, it was American-based teams that actually dominated this Canadian sport. And if you live in the United States, like in a big city, you could live a lifetime and not meet a hockey fan. You would only meet them, really, if you were to, to want to do that, if you were to, to go to hockey games, if you, if you were to, to, to post uh, on hockey forums. This is where you would meet them. But in Canada, it's an all-consuming sport, and yet Canadian-based teams just don't win the Stanley Cup anymore. And uh, uh, that's because, statistically, there's fewer of them than American-based teams and uh, American markets are larger and can probably attract uh, slightly better players. So, and it's also just, I think, uh, luck. It's a matter of luck to some extent. 